Well, I'm scared to preach today. I've been lost because no way I can live up to whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> so don't lower your expectations. <laughs> um, uh, times have changed a lot over the last few decades, you may have noticed. Um, when I was a child, growing up in the Indian Ontario, um, we used to play down by the highway a lot. <laughs> so my, we grew up on, the, on Highway 35, so when I say highway, I'm not talking about a back road, I'm talking about the main artery kind of into the highlands. <laughs> and uh, we, my parents had a house right on the highway, and of course the driveway came right down straight onto Highway 35. And in the springtime, the water would flow down beside the driveway or on the driveway, and it would kind of flood the, uh, the shoulder of the road right there. It was perfect for playing with. So we would spend hours down there um, uh, playing, and you know, with the good old rubber boot, you know, pulling your heel through the ground, you know, making trenches, and then having a big puddle, making dams. Good fun. We'd just be hours down there. And uh, I don't know, my mom never seemed to be, or my dad, were never too worried about us playing right down there on the highway. Which is, <laughs> I don't think you'd find anybody letting their kids do that nowadays, but you know. So one of my earliest theological conversations took place in this very spot while playing this very thing. And it was with a young gentleman named Barry Ward. We were all seven or eight or nine years old, I don't know. We were little kids. <laughs> and uh, Barry had come over to dig ditches with us and stuff. His grandfather, Earl Ward, had the, had the, uh, the garage across the road. And uh, so I, I can't remember what the whole thing was about, but as, as young little boys are wont to do, we were squabbling. Can you imagine? <laughs> and I don't remember the gist of what all we were squabbling about. Let's say it was something he was saying something bragging about his, his grandfather's garage across the road. So then we were bragging back. He was on our side of the road, playing with our, you know, in our ditch. <laughs> on my dad's property. It's mine, it's ours. And, and Barry says, it's not, no, it's not. He says, it's all God's. End of the theological conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think what rankled a little bit more, you know, here we were, my brother and I, we were, uh, you know, a church-going family, a Sunday school attending bunch of, of boys, and we should know all this stuff, and this guy, I don't know that he seen me inside of the church, but somehow he knew. <laughs> it was all God's. So that really put the kibosh in our conversation. So, and, and of course, that's also the gist of where I'm going today. Basically, that's, that's the sermon. Uh, we'll talk about ownership today. We're going to get there. We're going to go around that and back to it a, a few times. So you can tune out if that's all you want to hear. <laughs> um, ownership, right? That's a big deal. What's mine? What's ours? Uh, when we're young, we, we, we start to attach ourselves to things that are ours. And if you, if you come from a family with other children, for instance, especially, you know, that differentiates you. There's a lot of fights. No, that's mine. No, it's mine. You know? Those kinds of things. So we, we attach ourselves to certain toys. Uh, we can attach ourselves to perhaps a bicycle that's mine. Uh, and, and you know, as the years go by, we you know we th those things kind of define a little bit of who we are. We, we kind of who we are, what we're all about. The things we like are reflected in the things that we own, the things that we like. So as 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 we become teenagers, we may acquire things that are very important to us. When I was a teenager, uh, at some some. Well, those mid-teenage years, I got pretty excited about buying stuff that I had a few dollars in my pocket in my wallet at Consumers Distributing. <laughs> wow, what a place to shop. <laughs> what ever happened to that? <laughs> anyway, we're at Consumers Distributing. You can have one in the city, you know, we didn't have that in Minden. And um, so you go to Consumers, and Consumers was, for those of you who don't remember, it was kind of like a catalog. So you, you shop through the catalog in the front of the store, and then you go to the counter to present you the thing you want, and they go back into the secret warehouse and they bring up the, the product for you. <laughs> so wonderful. I, so a couple of, one of the things I bought was, was a tent. I was always shopping for tents and camping stuff, as you can imagine. And, and I bought this tent, and it, it, it was just it caught my eye, caught my fancy. And it had, a, it had an, a, a, an exterior frame with springs that held it up at the corners. And all these little metal parts that weighed a ton. So, and, the, and I didn't know how to put them together. It was, it was really the most horrid thing to hear. <laughs> and my, my friends teased me and called it springs and things. <laughs> the, the other thing that I bought from Consumers Distributing, which is my treasure and I still have it, because my mother found it in the house and brought it over and said, what do you want me to do with this? Is, unless I was wondering what this was, my first 
very own microphone. <laughs> Have you ever seen a microphone like that? No? <laughs> Going back, talking about 1973 or something like that. I was so proud of this. My very own microphone I bought from Consumer Distributed. You know, one of the high-end musical instrument stores. <laughs> but the, what's really cool about it is this is before we have those, one of those things we have on all our mic stand now, those, those arms that come off, you know, we stick our microphone close. Well, we didn't have anything like that. We just had cheap stuff. So this thing actually did that. It pulled it out so if you're playing a guitar, you're actually not so far away from your microphone. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Precious. <laughs> it probably doesn't work. It's glued together with a box up here because it's got dropped and broken so many times. Anyway, that's, that's, you, you may have things like that. We'll get to that. So, you know, as the years unfold, we start to collect things and, and we acquire things. Stuff. We start with, you know, maybe when we're fairly young, we buy a car or a, or, or a little truck or something. Then we may start buying some furniture. Time passes. We may buy a house. We may get jewelry. Um, all that's and on and on. What do we, we people collect things? My aunt, she collects lamps. Uh, I know guys that collect guitars. Uh, people have a lot of stuff. And that, that's perfectly normal. We like owning things. We do. I like my car. I like my guitar, which you guys, by the way, gave me. <laughs> but it's mine. <laughs> I like my books, having my own books. It's nice to have your own books. You know? so these things are, are, are treasures. So, so you've got yours too. What? I mean, you don't have to say it. Just think about it for a second. What's your stuff that you really like? You're happy you own it. It's mine. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with owning things, except sometimes, very often, I guess, we get overly attached to them. Now, Jesus talks about this in, uh, this is a different parable. We'll get back to our parable today, but, uh, or our story today. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells this parable about this guy who's rich, and his, his ground, his land, produces a, a huge crop. So he says, what am I going to do? I don't have enough room. So he builds bigger barns and big, bigger silos. And he says, he says to himself, this is Jesus telling the parable or a story he, he made up. He says, he said to himself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. So, so Jesus is, is not saying there's anything wrong with the guy. He didn't say the guy shouldn't have had that stuff. He said he didn't have the right attitude toward it. He thought, it's my, my, mind for me, 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 for me to be, to be drink and be married for the rest of my life. And that's an easy thing for people to slip into, that perspective, that perception of reality. And it's not, it's not reality. So it's the attitude, it's that attachment, that inordinate attachment, that idolatry. I mean, Scripture would actually set this up to us as an idolatry, because we're making that our treasure, that our security, that our first love, the stuff. And that's idolatry. And the selfishness that comes along with that, the selfishness that could creep in. So this guy, he's got all this stuff. He's going to eat, drink, and be merry, and, and you know, take his leisure for the rest of his days. But what about all the people around him that are in need? He's not thinking that. So God says, you know, to you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And then whose is it? But whose is it? Who owns all that now? Right? So. Let's just hold that in, in our thoughts when we think about, as we think about ownership today. Now let's look at our passage today. This is a pretty cool passage. And it's, it's Jesus escaping from a trap. So if, if you recall, uh, the Pharisees, who, who were looking for a way to get Jesus, and the, uh, send their disciples and the Herodians. So the Pharisees, you know, they were a strict religious sect that didn't like what Jesus was telling people, didn't like the popularity of Jesus, it was taken away from their prestige, among other things. And the Herodians, we don't hear too much about them, but they appear to be a group that supported Herod, and the kingship of Herod, who was the puppet king of the Romans. So, ipso facto, they are supported, they're supporters of the Roman reign, and by, by also by extension, of the taxation of the Romans, right? So, so the Romans taxed the Jewish people, they were, they were um, oppressed, subjugated people, and uh, the Herodians were in favor of that. So they're a sect of the Jews who were in favor of that. They're a political group. 
So they come to, to, to trick Jesus. They say, teacher. They're all so polite. They're oozing with, uh, uh, with uh, praise for him. But it's so phony, right? We know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Oh, the honey that's just flowing here. You aren't swayed by, by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, there's, a, there's a good question. <laughs> One that comes close to the hearts and home of the, all of us because we all have to pay taxes. And they don't usually like it. So, so essentially what they've done, the trap is this. They've got, they, they're putting Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. And I'll try to keep it simple because to, to, I really don't understand it that well. But, yeah, we're, we're, we have to go back 2,000 years in history. So, uh, on the one hand, so, so they're looking for him to say something that's going to wreck him one way or the other. Right? So if he says, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, then he's got all these people in, in the crowd, his followers, I mean, everybody, Moses a huge crowd around Jesus, and they're not so sure about paying taxes. Nobody likes Rome. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of rebels in the group. So, just to get a little kind of sense of, of the time and of the history of that time, it wasn't very long after this that the, 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 the rebels were so stirred up that they tried to take uh, their country back from Rome. And Rome came in and suppressed and crushed them brutally. So in 70 AD, so that's maybe, maybe around 40 years later, uh, the Romans came in and they, just, they crushed Jerusalem. Like they destroyed it, they burned it, they destroyed the temple, that's huge, beautiful Herod's temple on Jesus' day. Was, was, was wrecked in 70 AD. It's referred to or alluded to several times in the, in the, in the New Testament, uh, this destruction of Jerusalem. So they crushed and they killed, you know, literally thousands of the Jewish people. There's a place called Masada. Some of you uh, Mitchells were there uh, back in the day. That, that was one of the last stand places near the Dead Sea, I think it is, but uh, I haven't been, uh, of the, rebel, the rebellion of that day. So that was about 70 AD. So the, but all that's stirring up in the hearts of the people at that time. So if Jesus says, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, he's gonna, he could easily lose a whole lot of his following. And they, they would love that. But if he says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, <laughs> well, they're going to run to the authorities. And this rebel is saying we shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar. You know? He's treasonous. We should kill him. So how's he going to win? Right? So that's... So Jesus says, Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites. Because <laughs> they're hypocritical. They're, they're giving him all this praise, right? They're pumping him up so that they can tear him down. He says, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. We've talked about that's a, that's a coin that represents about a day's wage. And he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription Caesar's, they replied. So on the back of the coin, or on the one side of the coin, there's a picture of Caesar. Back in Jesus' day, there's a picture of Caesar. Kind of like our coins today. You ever notice that? The, there's a picture of Caesar on every coin still today. <laughs> Caesarette. <laughs> so, so the queen, and I wonder about that. Is, is, is she on every coin? You think she's on every one of her coins? Some of them have an elf on them, right? And a blue nose. She's on the other side. <laughs> Every last one of her coins has got the queen. And uh, even the toony and the loony. Uh, so, so, so that's not a new thing. It's, so it's a way of saying that this is government issue. This is legal tender. Uh, it, it's, it's a value because the government has said it's a value. So it's tied somehow to our government and to the crown and in Jesus' day to Caesar. So he says, whose portrait is this and whose description? We'll come back to that. <laughs> and... And then they say Caesar. So he says to them, okay, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. <laughs> so what a crazy and wonderful answer. I mean, uh, it says when they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. So somehow he stumped them. And we're, you know, we're, we're left trying to scratch our heads. And think, what? What's that talk? What's that talking about? So, Probably the Herodians, for instance, who were supporters of, of Caesar and, and the tax and all that, probably heard when Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, probably said, oh, he's saying we should pay taxes. But if you didn't believe that that's, that you should, you could hear him saying, well, give, if there's something to Caesar's, you should give it to him. That makes sense. Taxes aren't necessarily belonging to him. <laughs> so so you, you could think this through however you want it almost. 
and come up with the answer you, you'd like. Uh, so, so it left the people kind of walking away, <coughs> scratching their heads, not sure what, what, he, what, he, what he meant. But here's the kicker. There's, something, uh, there's another layer of meaning in this conversation that we may not get. It, when he says, whose image, it says, it says in my translation here, who's, uh, bah, 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 whose portrait is this? Well, the, the word, it, it should be the word image. It's, in Greek, the word is icon. You know when some of you have computers, you got all those little pictures that are up on your desktop. Those are icons, little, little symbols, uh, and little picturettes uh, of, of something. So the word image, that's from this Greek word icon, which means image. Now, image, for Jesus' audience, was a loaded word. Because for starters, back in the, the creation account, it says, it, 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 we were made in the image of God. People are made in God's image. But... On the other hand, we're not allowed to create any images of God. Remember the Ten Commandments? You, you, shall not, you shall not make any graven image. So it wasn't just that they weren't allowed to make... Uh, they were, the, the law was not only that you weren't allowed to have other gods. You shall have no other gods before me, that's true. But you shall not make any graven images. You can't pr pretend you know what I look like and carve something that's, that's going to represent me. So when... Uh, when Moses comes back to the people when he's been up on Mount Sinai, he comes back, back and Aaron has made a, a golden calf and the people are worshipping him and he says behold your gods, O Israel that delivered you out of Egypt and he's horrified, and God's horrified because they've made this image of God which isn't allowed, it's against God's, God's law we're not to make any, any images except that God has made images us so that's interesting so that, that's something that, that so they, and, and mean, the other side of that is, so, so and Queen Elizabeth is not a goddess to us, right? I don't think. Maybe to some worship royalty. No. So, so you know, we may admire her, we may respect her, but we don't worship her. In Jesus' day, the emperor of Caesar was a god. He was one of the pantheon of gods that they would worship. And they had a lot of gods, but he was one of them. And he was supposed to be revered and worshipped as a god. So actually, they, they've got an image of the god on the coin. So it's idolatry, <laughs> in a sense, uh, to be using these coins and to be making these coins. So that, that's why the Jews of Jesus' day had a lot of problems with this, uh, you know, uh, Roman coinage. But uh, he says, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they cried. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So if we take this to mean this has got Caesar's image on it, and therefore we give to Caesar, what has got God's image on it that we have to give to God? That's me. Right? So, so that's, that's kind of implied in all this. So let's go back to ownership. And I've I mentioned that you know it's, it's okay to own things. I've said, you know, it, it's perfectly normal, perfectly human. Uh, it's in the scriptures. You know, we can own things, but you know what? We actually don't own anything. You don't actually own anything at all. You you uh, you sub owner it, if you will. So I don't know where our, our, our the bulletin might say, but we, in our bulletin today we read a little chunk when we were in our opening uh, words called, called the worship part. It was from based on Psalm 24. So the 24th Psalm starts like this: The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So the Scripture very clearly teaches, and this is the perspective all the way through from front to back. That the earth is God's and everything in it belongs to Him. Everything in it belongs to Him. So everything that we treasure, everything that we own, we don't own. My microphone. <laughs> I don't even own my microphone. God owns it. My guitar that you gave me. I don't even own it. God owns it. Right? And everything else you can think of or see or, or, or understand as being yours, isn't really yours. It belongs actually to God. It's his. So that leaves us in the position of uh, kind of sub-owners, if you will. <laughs> you know, kind of like superintendents of a building that's owned by somebody else, but we're in charge of it. We use the word stewardship a lot. And steward, th this is a good word. Stewardship means we're in charge, we're stewards of something that belongs to somebody else. We're managers. We're managing something that belongs to somebody else. This is my thing here. <laughs> uh, in, in our in our offering, you can notice we sit, we sit. I think for 25 years now, when we've done the offering, 
We sing. Uh, do we think about what we're saying when we sing? We give thee but thine own. Right? Whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone. A trust, O oh Lord, from thee. You're all saying it all the time. <laughs> do you realize what you're doing to yourself? <laughs> you're saying, I don't own anything. I only manage stuff. And, and Jesus actually speaks to this fairly strongly in some of his parables. When he talks about the, the parables of the talents, he's talking about human life and human existence. He said a king or a, king or a landlord or a holder or somebody came along and he called the servants together and he gives the one one talent or one three or two, I forget, and the other one five, and he goes off to a far country, which is an image of God who seems to be off in a far country, right? And then he comes back and he says, okay, show me how you did. And the guy with five says, look, you gave me five, I made five more. And he says, good job. And the guy with two or three says, Is this, you gave me two, uh, here's two more. He says, good job. And the guy with one comes back and says, you gave me one, so I, I was afraid of you, so I dug in the ground and hit it. Here it is, here it is back, your one. He says, you wicked servant. That's a powerful story. And what Jesus is telling us, this is God's perspective on human existence. He, he has given us life, and he's given us talents, and he's given us opportunities, and at the end of our days, he's going to say, how did we get with that? With my stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, it's not just the stuff. So, if you, back to our church, it says, the, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who dwell in it. Or all who live in it. So it's not just the stuff, it's we ourselves belong to God. We are, he has ownership over us. You may not like that language because it's kind of like slavery. And I'm going to come back to that too. But, uh, but that's what it says. We actually are, we, we are possessions of the living God. You and I. And it doesn't matter whether we're Christian or whether we're Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu, whether we speak Italian or, you know, uh, whatever. Mandarin, <laughs> French, English. How old we are, how rich we are, it doesn't matter. He owns every last human being. We belong to him, according to this. <laughs> so God made us. He gifted us and, and, and gave us all kinds of good gifts and, and, and opportunities in life. He holds us accountable, as we heard from Jesus' parables. He will bring our life to an end when he so chooses. Our times are in his hands. And he will judge us. We are his. And he can do it with us as he sees fit. It's a good thing he's a good God. And Jesus says this in this passage. Give to God what is God's. So what's the logical conclusion? If we're going to give to God's, well, God what is God's, what has the image of God? We're saying, he's saying, give God yourself. Turn yourself over to God. He's telling us to offer our lives up to the service and the purposes of God. Not to our own. Now that's a problem. There's a dilemma. And it's not something Jesus wasn't aware of when he came to earth. I mean, human beings in general uh, have God's existence, even his, let alone his purpose. His existence is barely in view. It's like on the very edge of our peripherals uh, of the human race as a whole. We're, we're way too busy for that. And we're pretty unaware of what his purposes are. Because we have our own ideas and purposes. And Jesus, he came extremely aware of this predicament. This brokenness, this, this disconnect between why we exist and how we behave. This thing that's you know, broken in humanity. This, what scripture calls sin. It's rebellion. It's independence. It's, it's uh, arrogance. It's selfishness. It's lust. You know, all the things that, that go against the perfect plan of God uh, to make a community of people who worship Him and love each other. Uh, so, he came to offer up his life for us on the cross. That was the heart of the matter. This is the most extreme act of love. We call it redemption. But what's redemption? redemption we, we think of redemption as a theological word, but in its first instant, when it was being used in the Bible, it probably was more of an economic word. So it's like, <laughs> like say you, you run into hard times, and you've got nothing, but you've got a few possessions, and you know that you can take them to the pawn shop, Right? You take your, your beautiful Rolex watch, 
Mine's time mix. Your mic, precious mic. <laughs> no! Your wedding ring. Ah, no. Never thought that. Your uh, snowblower, you know, your precious possessions. And you can take them to the pawn shop and they will give you money. So then you've got some money to live on. But, but, so, but you, you're, you wish you had it back. It's your precious, right? So let's say you came into some money. You won the lottery. I don't know. Your aunt Matilda died. And you came into money. Then you could go back to the pawn shop and buy your stuff back again, couldn't you? You know what you call that? Redeeming it. Buying it back. And it comes back to its rightful owner who purchases it. So in, in the ancient world, that happened a lot with it, around slavery. So we come back to slavery. So slavery was as common as anything in the ancient times, especially if you ran into debt. You ran into debt, you couldn't pay somebody, you could become their slave. And uh, you, you would work off your debt slowly after, uh, off, uh, after many years. But they, meanwhile, they would house you and your family. They would feed and clothe you and take care of you, keep you, and you just had to work for them. In, in, in many cases, it was a good arrangement. It was the economics of the ancient world. But let's say your cousin or your brother or somebody near you thought, I'm going to get them out of their predicament. I'm going to pay the debt and, and set their, the slaves free. Guess what that's called? Redemption. Okay? That's redeeming. And that's what the gospel is about. So although we belong to God by nature, by his creative power, we are lost to him, the human race. We are sold under sin, and we are essentially in hock. Jesus buys us back with his blood at the cross. And it's when we get that, when that clicks, when that, when that to sifts through into our hearts, when we believe it, when we're convicted of it, that we can truly start to turn ourselves over to his purposes. And only then. And, and truly understand ourselves as his possession. And, 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 under, and see ourselves as those who are to be engaged in, in his purposes. And that, that there's a word, an ancient word we, we have, and we're going to sing it in this hymn we're about to sing. It's called consecration. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. And it's a process. What the process is, is really becoming who we are. Becoming God's, you know, God's possessions. And therefore, acting and behaving and living and thinking the way he designed us to, to do. And that's a process. You know, to, to think with the thoughts that God gave us to think. To do the things that God has called us to do. To, to, you know, Melissa and John did it to me yesterday. They sang that song again. <laughs> I, I almost always I love her like a baby. I'm walking in. He's walking in my shoes. You know, he's singing with my voice. He's reaching out with my with my hands, helping someone make the right choice. Like, ah. <laughs> but that's consecration, as Jesus, you know, is formed in us, and uh, you know, we, we we come to the purpose for which God made us. He who owns us. Paul says in the, to the Corinthians. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your life or with your body. God owns us by virtue of his creating us. And he doubly owns us by virtue of his redeeming us. Shall we act accordingly? Shall we pray?